Greetings, fellow book lovers, and welcome back to Colin's Corner. Today, guys, I'm going to be doing a review of the Far Seer trilogy. This is the first trilogy in the grander overall series called The Realm of the Elderlings, written by Rob and Hobb. I do want to put a disclaimer, if you didn't see in the title of the video, that this will be relatively spoiler-free. I'm not going to give away any main plot events that happen, but I will be talking about some themes and some characters and just what the main series is about. So without anything further, let's get into this review. So in this first trilogy, our main character's name is Fitz Chivalry Farseer, otherwise known as Fitz, and he is an illegitimate prince. We are introduced to Fitz as a boy in Assassin's Apprentice, which is the first book in the series. And with the succeeding two books, Royal Assassin and Assassin's Quest, we follow Fitz as he grows from boyhood to manhood and as he figures out the world around him. Now this takes place in the fictional kingdom called the Six Duchies, which are ruled by the Farseer line. We learn in this first book that Fitz is the bastard son of Prince Chivalry, who has abdicated the throne. He has left, he has chosen not to be a presence in the royal court. So Fitz essentially is dropped off at the stables at Buck Keep, which is the main town of the Six Duchies. And so essentially, the stable hand Burrich begins raising Fitz, is kind of thrown this young boy and told, deal with this, this is Prince Chivalry's bastard son. So we are introduced very early, very early on to Burrich, who is one of the main characters in the story, and also uh, Fitz's grandfather, King Shrew. Now, in basically getting dropped his son's bastard son, King Shrew has to decide what he's going to do with Fitz and how Fitz is going to fit into this royal family, into this royal court. So what he decides to do, as the title might allude to, um, he decides to train Fitz in the art of being an assassin in the shadows of the royal court so as to maybe keep him involved but not to bring too much shame to the Farseer name by having a royal bastard with a position of public power. So over the course of the series, we follow Fitz as he learns the art of being an assassin, as he kind of figures out the world around him and the royal court and how to navigate all of this craziness that he just kind of, like I said, got plopped into it is an extremely zoomed in, focused look at Fitz as he grows and he learns about the world around him and how to navigate the royal court. And we watch him grow from a boy to a man, essentially. Assassin's Apprentice is very much so an introduction to both Fitz as a character and the world that Robin Hobb has created for us. Um, Royal Assassin, the second book in the series, certainly ramps up the intensity and the pace a bit. And I believe personally that the series is closed out beautifully with Assassin's Quest. And by the end, you know, when I finished the series, I looked back at where Fitz was and compared to where he started. And I was simply amazed at what Hobb was able to do with, with Fitz as a character and how she was able to build out her world in this first trilogy. So Hobb chooses to write the Farseer trilogy in the first person past tense. Now, this is one of the first experiences I have had reading a book in first person past tense in fiction. I, maybe, I, maybe I have before, I don't remember it. Um, so I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it because primarily most of the books that I read are written in some kind of third person, limited third person omniscient, something like that. So I didn't know if this was going to work for me and um, you know, I think that to write this trilogy in the first person perspective was a bold decision by Hobb, but not only was it a bold decision, I believe it was the right decision. Hobb is an extremely talented writer, and what she's able to do by putting us in Fitz's head while also building out such a compelling and vast cast of characters around him all through Fitz's point of view swept me off my feet by the end of this series. Hobbs' prose to me was both beautiful, but at the same time, not so dense that it ever felt like it was over my head or distinctly trying to be highbrow in its delivery. Um, for instance, like I never really felt like I had to pull my phone out 
and look up the definition of a word while I was reading and have that like take me out of the story. Um, it was beautifully written and it was very immersive and it drew me into this world. Hob does a tremendous job of including these small details about the world that just makes it feel like such a real place. Uh, I, I could very easily picture myself in the story and Buckkeep Castle in the town of Buck around Buckkeep Castle felt familiar and comfortable to me by the end of this trilogy. Um, you know, I felt safe and I felt cozy with Fitz when he was in his bedchambers and, you know, like that was kind of his safe place. And when he was in there, I felt that too. And, um, you know, I felt like I was able to just be a welcome guest with Fitz as he wandered down to the kitchen to talk to cook Sarah. Like I felt, I felt like with this perspective and the way that Hob describes the world around her, I was so immersed in this world that I really felt like Buckkeep and the Six Duchies was a place for some reason that like I know in the back of my head. Like it was, it was really cool to see how she was able to build this world out all through the first person narrative. One of my favorite aspects of Hobbes' writing style that she employs in this series, and I'm not sure if she does it in subsequent series of The Realm of the Elderlings, but I really enjoyed this in the Farseer trilogy, is that she would kind of use the beginnings of the chapters as essentially like mini prologues. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. The beginnings of each chapters would sometimes be a few paragraphs, maybe a page, a page and a half, of italicized text that wasn't exactly what was going on in the story but what it was was a small piece of detail or a small piece of lore about the history or some major figure in the history of the six duchies and i think it worked really really well in this trilogy this leads me very nicely into the next thing that i want to talk about regarding the farseer trilogy and that is the characters this is hobbs bread and butter um Beginning with Fitz, our main character, because of the narration choice of first person, he is essentially an unreliable narrator. And what I mean by that is that Fitz isn't necessarily going around deliberately like misleading the reader. However, what he is is a child in some of the parts of the books and a young teen, like a pre-adolescent. And he's very prone to making impulsive, emotion-based decisions. And because of this, Fitz is one of the most frustrating, but like lovable for me characters that I've ever read in fiction. Now he is young. And again, we, since we are only getting the first person perspective, we aren't necessarily aware of the other characters motives and intentions. So a lot of times what happens is that we're getting things through Fitz's eyes and we think like Fitz thinks which is sometimes wrong. Sometimes he's so young or doesn't know enough about the politics of court life to really understand people's motivations. So he can sometimes get the wrong ideas about things. Not only do we get to intimately know Fitz as a character, but Hobbes has developed some of the most believable and interesting characters that I've ever read in fiction through the lens of Fitz. Slowly but surely, through Fitz's eyes, we get to know some of the most important people to not only Fitz, but we figure out to the entire series and the plot of the story. Now, we go from being suspicious of some of these characters before Fitz grows to trust some of them and before he gets to know them. And we just slowly, before we know it as the reader, either fall in love with them or love to absolutely hate them. There are a variety of father figures in this series, such as Burrich, the stable hand, who we were introduced to very early on, Chade, who is Fitz's assassin mentor, essentially, uh, Fitz's uncle, Verity. And these guys all kind of fill a different role, maybe, or have a different style, but fill the role of father figure for Fitz. We have compelling and absolutely reproachable villains, such as Regal, and we have enigmatic but unbelievably intriguing characters such as the fool who is probably my favorite character other than Fitz. Something that is personally important to me as a girl dad and that always stands out to me as a reader is when an author is able to write compelling female characters and there are quite a few of them 
in this trilogy. Tetrican and Patience are two characters in this story that have not only a profound impact on Fitz as he grows up, but end up having a very profound impact on the overall plot of the story. So they are formidable, they are to be respected, and they take no crap. There are truly no characters in this series that were not intriguing to me in some way or another, and I was able to empathize and understand where all of these characters were coming from, whether or not I was pulling for them. You'd be hard pressed to not develop an emotional connection to many of the characters by the end of this trilogy. Now, as this is an epic fantasy series, I believe I would be remiss not to at least talk about the magic that exists in the world of the six duchies and possibly beyond. Um, so we are introduced to two forms of magic in this first Farseer trilogy, and they are called the wit and the skill. Now, both of these forms of magic are related to the mind in some way. So the wit is the old magic of this world, and it is often looked down on by society. Its, its wielders are viewed as being dirty or tainted in some way, and it feels almost kind of witch hunty the way that society treats people with the wit because they, I think, are scared because they don't fully understand the wit. A wielder of the wit is essentially able to share their mind with an animal companion. Um, thoughts, emotions, and communication can all be done through the mind of a wit user and their animal. Now, the skill is a form of magic that is passed down through the royal Farseer line. Uh, the skill is essentially a form of mental telepathy that allows skill users to communicate through their mind. And with extremely gifted skill users, there's essentially no physical limit to this. So, as you can imagine, this is a very powerful political. Uh, war tactics type of skill to possess. Wrapped up seamlessly within all the elements that I've already talked about so far, Hob is able to tackle some very weighty and difficult themes. So the first of which would be trauma. Guys, it goes through a lot in this series. I had so much compassion and empathy and I felt I don't know if pity is the right word, but I felt for this guy so hard in this series. And, you know, he, he goes through physical and emotional torment and all these normal pre-adolescent and teenage struggles that we all have gone through are magnified to this crazy level because of his place in the royal court. So he's got people constantly berating him for his you know silly actions or mistakes or just for making normal young person emotions based decisions and so you know throughout the course of the series he has to learn to understand that yes he may be a royal bastard and kind of an outcast of the royal family but he still is looked upon as somebody that that you know has royal blood running through his veins and can bring shame to the family name if he messes up. Next is identity. I kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, you know, Fitz feels like an outcast from the, basically the minute he's able to think for himself from six, seven, you know, eight years old, he doesn't feel a part of. Uh, it's hard to feel a part of when you're a bastard and also when you don't have your father and your mother around to show you love. And yes, there are characters that care about Fitz, but he struggles to find his place, and it takes him a while to kind of get on his feet in this series. And on top of that, we are able to see themes of identity work their way through the other characters in this series through Fitz's eyes. It's all these people in the series are trying to figure out how they fit into Fitz's life. What kind of roles do they have? Should they try to be a mother figure? Should they shun him and treat him like a lot of the society around him does because he's a royal bastard? Should they give him love? Do they need to teach him how to protect himself in the royal court and in the world? So we see these characters kind of grow along with Fitz and figure out their identity or if they had one and they knew their place. A lot of these people are kind of rethinking what's important to them throughout the course of the series. And another one is going to be loyalty. So 
Fitz and the other characters they that we follow are forced to make many difficult decisions based around loyalty. Who did they claim loyalty to? Or who did they pledge loyalty to? Um, who should they be loyal to? Should they rethink their loyalties? And with this, we get a lot of people making strictly loyalty-based decisions. And we get some people that kind of go against what they thought they believed in. And anytime that one of these scenarios happens, it's interesting because I, even if I don't agree with the decisions that some of these people are making, or if they're making a decision that hurts somebody else in the series or isn't good for somebody that I'm pulling for or some plot line that I'm pulling for, Pop is able to do it in a way that I completely understand why they made the decision even if it's making me want to if i had hair pull my hair out like you can't do this it's gonna mess up everything that happened over here but she's able to do it and, and i'm like i can't i'm so mad that i can't blame them for making this decision the last thing that i want to talk about is actually gender equality and gender acceptance now this book was released in 1995. It was published in 1995. And Hobb was so incredibly ahead of her time when it comes to these issues that I literally had to go back. Like I knew that this book was published in the 1990s, but I had to go back and just make sure because she handled these issues so incredibly well. But I was like, there's no way this book was written in 1995. I know people were fighting for things like gender equality and gender acceptance back then, but it wasn't like it is today. And, you know, Hobb is able to do this, deal with this theme, tackle this theme throughout the course of this book. And I was absolutely amazed at some of the, the conversations that happened between characters that just felt so natural. And, you know, it wasn't preachy in any way. It was just like, examples of people trying to show somebody else that like the most important thing that we need to keep in mind is not who we are not what we are not where we come from not what we identify as but that we're human beings and we're in this together and we should love and respect each other when given the chance to this series to me was such an amazing example of the importance of continuing to read fiction now the story stands on its own as being a story worthy of enjoyment in my own subjective opinion but even more so Hobb as a writer has gotten me to think about my life and my place in the world critically and there are so many lessons to be learned tucked neatly into these pages and I truly believe it is a mark of good literature to help readers think like this while also delivering on the story end of things. The Realm of the Elderlings has been extremely popular in our little corner of fantasy booktube over the past couple of years. However, to me, Hobb exhibits the talents as an author and as a writer that deserve to be recognized probably more than she already gets recognized for, if that makes sense. So what Hobb, among authors like Tolkien and Martin, have shown me is that fantasy as a genre is deserving of being critically analyzed and kind of taking the deep dive into it and exploring the themes and examining the human condition. These types of authors make me think about what it means to be a human being in the world. How are human beings treating each other? And while I recognize that this may not be a series for everybody, uh, it is definitely a series that works for me and I'm very, very excited to continue in the realm of the Elderlings and kind of watch this series play out in this world grow before my eyes. That's going to do it for me, guys. If you've stuck around this long, thank you so much for watching the video. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a like. And if you're enjoying the content so far, please consider subscribing to the channel. It helps a lot and it is greatly appreciated. I hope you are all enjoying what you're currently reading. And as always, you guys are always welcome in Colin's Corner.